welcome to Films and Stuff with your hosts, Pete Mitchell and Ethan Hunt. Pete, Films and Stuff. We are coming to you from the first week of autumn, no longer summer. That's right. Well, the first, yes, that's correct. That's absolutely right. So even though it's the second week of September, the first week of September ended with a bang. I'm sure you must have heard we had National Cinema Day in the U.S. I did not hear that. Oh, oh, you missed <laughs> That's out. That's a thing? So, National Cinema Day? Yes. So the Theater Association in the United States created basically not an official holiday, but an unofficial holiday. Almost every cinema across the country on the 3rd of September charged $3 for every showing. A last hurrah for the summer and also a way to boost viewership because by saying, hey, listen, our tickets are normally, I think the average in the U.S. is like $9.25 or so across the U.S. on average. So they Mm -hmm. said, listen, we're basically 70% off. Come in, watch a movie, grab some popcorn, escape the heat and get in on the summer box office. And that's exactly what happened. Oh, man, I definitely would have done that. Keep me, let, remind, let's remind everyone next year. That's definitely something we don't want to miss. That's right. So it actually, it was, it came to my attention after recording last week. And it was something that slipped my mind. I had heard of the rumors, but it wasn't confirmed. So of course, now it's too late, but we'll keep that in mind for next year. I think it was a very, very big success in terms of attendance And I imagine Mm. that this is something that the National Theaters Association or whatever that cinema association is in the United States will want to keep that going in the future because it really was a boon for the box office. And we actually saw a resurgence after quite a few weeks away from being number one on the box office. Top Gun Maverick came screaming back and took back first place again. God bless Top Gun Maverick, huh? Really saved the entire... The entire summer box office. You raise a good point. Let's let's do a recap. Why don't we do a recap, do recap of our predictions? Why don't you read off your top ten? Because because you were quite quite on the money for. I think we both were. I think I would say that we pretty had a we had a good run. My top ten prediction was in order from one to ten: Thor, Love and Thunder, Jurassic World, Doctor Strange. Top Gun 2, Minions 2, Nope, DC League of Super Pets, Elvis, Bullet Train, and Lightyear. And remember, I specifically put Lightyear in last because before it came out, it was already starting to get banned in a lot of countries in the Middle East and in East Asia. So there was a lot of negative press about it. And I thought that the American domestic gross would not be strong enough to support a worldwide ranking. I think when I look at your list, that is a very, very good list in terms of what you really thought was going to be the best, the highest grossing films. I feel like my list is a little bit, except for Top Gun, is a list of how good the films are going to be. But here's my top okay. 10. Yeah. I mean, I'm just saying that revisionist, that's not really what I wanted or that's not really what I predicted, but I'm just saying based on the differences. I had Doctor Strange, Multiverse of Madness, number one, Thor, Love and Thunder, two, Minions, three, Lightyear, four. And I'd like to point out those top four were not the best four, but they did largely follow the ranking between those four. Then I had Top Gun, five. So that that's on me. I should have moved that up to number one. I had Jurassic World Dominion, six, Bullet Train, Hustle. What is Hustle? That's the basketball movie with uh, oh, Net- yeah. Adam Sandler on Netflix. Yes. Then I've got Elvis, nine. You had it, eight. And then my wild card was Day Shift on Netflix with Jamie Foxx, Snoop Dogg, and Dave Franco's brother. No, just Dave Franco, James Franco's brother. <laughs> this is the oh, same mistake you Dave made Franco. last time. <laughs> Dave Franco himself. James Franco's brother. That's right. I, my, my big my big mistake was my big mistake was Top Gun. That's the only one I really wish I could take back. Well, you to read be out honest, how these. I think yeah. that you know 
I don't think either of us saw it happening on the scale that it did because, uh, you know, first of all, it was an amazing movie, by the way. It was a I great think movie. I think, yeah. first of all, you have to remember one of the things our listeners have to remember is that this is based on worldwide numbers, not domestic. If this were domestic, the list order would be different. And I think we would have yeah. structured it differently on purpose. And Top Gun has always been a pseudo like recruiting tool for the U.S. armed forces, right? This is... Yeah. Uh, it's almost like a, this is what life could be if you were Tom Cruise in the Navy today. And it's, you know, we saw that after the first Top Gun came out in 86, you saw a massive surge in naval applications because of that movie. That kind of success would not necessarily translate globally. So that's why, you know, this is, remember, that's why we had suggested that Top Gun would do well, but maybe not necessarily globally. So I I think that movie, I think that movie, though, it even, I hope you agree, that movie was so good, it even exceeded my greatest expectations. It was. And and hilariously enough, if you go back, you know, for listeners who have been with us for long enough, we'll remember when we recapped Mission Impossible. We lamented the fact that Tom Cruise never had a yeah. billion dollar movie. And we said yeah. that of all the A list stars, us. it was a shocker to us. to us that there were movies like Jurassic World on that billion dollar list, but none of Tom Cruise's movies on that list. Don't so, get me started on Jurassic World. Yeah. I know you're going to get me started, but do not get me we're started. We're going to have to. All right. So without further ado, why don't we, why don't we talk about the actual results? Let's talk about the actual so, results. Number one. This is worldwide world, box office worldwide, revenue, right? Worldwide. Correct. Yep. Worldwide. And these numbers I pulled from the numbers.com. So, you know, if we're wrong, you can blame them. Number one global movie <laughs> of the summer was, uh, which kicked off. If I want, if I remember correctly, either March first or April first, I can't remember, but it was like a weird. It wasn't what we would normally yeah. consider a summer blockbuster, yeah. a, a summer kickoff based on yeah. uh, actual, you know, calendar Correct. year. But anyway, mm-hmm. the number one movie of 2022 summer box office: Top Gun Maverick with 1.44 billion dollars. World well deserved. Well deserved. Well deserved. Really a good movie. I think if you've heard our uh, review, you know exactly the problems we had with it. But in general, we both agreed that this was a stellar movie through and through. Stellar and movie. Quite possibly the exemplar of how legacy sequels, if not all sequels, should be made. I cried. It was fantastic. Simply put, there should, we should have a new rating system. Did Ethan tear up? <laughs> then our second most successful movie this summer, Jurassic World Dominion with $998 million. I find this to be fraudulent. <laughs> I find this to be absolutely fraudulent. In the history of Jurassic Park, I've, I've really tried to defend this franchise. This movie was just Honestly, garbage. Yeah. Then you have... The only... I I just want to say one more statement because I'm so frustrated by this movie. I think that this only was popular... Or it it only generated this amount of money because of brand name recognition. And it must have been the only thing in theaters and people just went to it. Yeah. Because nothing about the the cinematic qualities of it justified to be a billion dollar movie. Certainly. Certainly. Then you had number three, Doctor Strange, the Multiverse of Madness, with nine hundred and fifty-two million. Which, if yep. you remember correctly, when it first came out, all the critics said that this movie was a box office flop. And with all due respect to those critics, nine hundred and fifty-two million dollars, but is not a flop by any circumstances, yep. and certainly not for a character. This has nothing to do with Benedict Cumberbatch, who's excellent. But with a character who is, for all intents and purposes, a B or C tier yeah. character within the comic universe, yeah. that's a huge deal. Can, can we say something about Strange MOM though? Yeah, I mean, I, I think that if you're at if you're at MCU, 
like you're kind of breathing a sigh of relief. You know, it's kind of like, okay, like we basically got a billion, like we all keep our jobs yet. You know, I, I think if, I think they probably wanted like this to be 1.2, 1.4, 1.6, like the good old days. I think a billion was really the minimum they could have brought in and, and still kind of kept their jobs. I don't think anyone in the strange world is really celebrating this. I think they're breathing a sigh of relief. And they're kind of like, yeah, that's, I think that's kind does, of the score we needed to get. I think it does two things. One, I think it solidifies, at least in the mind of Disney, it solidifies that Benedict Cumberbatch is the de facto leader of the yeah. MCU going forward. Because his results out, far outpaced even Thor, and we'll get to that. Yeah. So I think it, you know, it confirms that okay, we no longer have Robert Downey Jr. in Iron Man. We no longer have, you know, Chris. No more Chris uh, Evans. Chris Evans as Captain America. So who's going yeah. to be our anchor point that everyone likes in the MCU? I think this solidifies that for Benedict Cumberbatch. Yeah. And two, I think it also comes down to budget. I think the budget for Doctor Strange was far less than it was for, for example, Thor. And so. Which further proves that, at least in Disney's mind, that you don't need to spend $300 million to make a movie that's profitable, uh, at least this profitable. And again, and I think that, again, we're going to talk about that with Thor. That's where it really boils down to. Mm -hmm. So uh, that's Doctor Strange in third place. In fourth place, we had Minions, The Rise of Gru with $894 million. Not a shocker to me because, again, the Minions are the Minions. It's a summer movie. It was one of the first few children's movies, animated movies, that released this summer. And, you know, everyone loves Despicable Me. Everyone loves Minions. So it wasn't a shock to me. We're going to get another Minions movie in two years. Almost certainly within the next five years, we're going to see a Minions 3. Almost certainly. Yeah. Then you had Thor number five. This was the shocker for me. Thor: Love and Thunder with seven hundred and forty nine million, placing it. I mean, that that's, almost that's exactly dis- two hundred million a less than right? Doctor Strange. That's a massive disappointment. And again, it sounds weird and odd to say it's a disappointment for a movie that made seven hundred and fifty million dollars to be a disappointment box office wise. But considering they spent like almost five hundred million, or so let's say four hundred million dollars making this movie, yes, it's a disappointment because that means that at seven hundred fifty million dollars, they probably just about broke even or just made a little bit of money on this movie. So in terms you know, of financially, not that you know, great. Critically, I mean, not that great. I guess the way that I look at it also is that I mean, there's there's. The money itself, right? And this is all could be like a little bit fuzzy accounting. So, I mean, let's not get too bent out of shape over it. But I think there's also an emotional aspect of this, Mm -hmm. right? Which is when you left the theater, Thor Love and Thunder, was the overall audience sentiment like, that was amazing. I can't wait for the next one. Yeah. And the the answer is that I think that's the bigger problem. Like if it's 749, you could argue like, ah, uh, you know, there was bad weather, the release schedule, Absolutely. blah, blah, blah. But, and, and you could justify it somehow. I mean, but that's half of Ragnarok. And Ragnarok, I left Ragnarok like saying, whoa, I wish that never would have ended. If that movie was another hour, I gladly would have sat through that movie. Thor, Love and Thunder, like it started slow and it continued slow. And by the time it ended, you know, like I was ready, like packing up my tissues and packing up my everything. And I was, I was ready to go, you know? Yeah. I, and, and I think that's, that's really the problem, which is emotionally, I don't think that anyone left still hungry for more Thor. And definitely no one left, you know, like this new storyline now with his his potential daughter. I don't think anyone's like, oh my God, I've got to see how that plays out. Yeah. Yeah. I think There's that's no the, I think that's the other thing that the MCU really has a reckoning with is because they're so now devoid of superstars. Yeah. 
so there's two comments I have with the MCU, right? So one is because of that, they've kind of focused on building up a younger stable of talent. It's almost like the minor league. Like in every one of the movies and TV shows, you've got a younger new Hawkeye. You've got a younger new superstar, in, not superstar, but star in America Chavez, in, in Strange. Doctor Strange 2, right? Because yep. she's also, she's going to be the younger one there. Mm-hmm. In Black Panther 2, we're going to be introduced to Iron Heart, who's going to be like supposed to be the new re- iteration of Iron Man. You've got on one hand, the MCU basically saying, okay, let's build up our stable of talent for the next couple of phases, kind of like what we did with the first phase, right? And so what we'll do is we'll restock our talent with really young actors so that we can kind of hold on to them for as long as possible. And I think their mentality right now is kind of becoming like a sports team. So I don't know if you saw this, but there are rumors that for the next phase of the MCU, Disney has signed contracts with John Krasinski and like they they named a bunch of uh, A-list superstars, right? And that announcement on Twitter, it felt really like what you would see at like the NFL combine or at like the trading day of like a baseball team. It almost felt like they were announcing their roster for the next phase. Kind of like, forget about the DC extended universe. They're all in rough shape there. If you want to talk about a superstar, uh, you know, superhero team, You should stick to Team Marvel instead of Team DC. We've just signed these five A-list actors and they're really going at it. It really made me feel like I was watching uh, a draft day or a combine and they were like, okay, well, these are the guys that we're signing. And, you know, we've signed 10-year contracts with them. It was quite impressive, actually. So it's a bit of a mixed metaphor, I know, but I figured that, you know, you'd appreciate that given the sports analogy. I do appreciate anything that has NFL combine. Yeah. (laughs) Uh, okay, All so right. sorry, that was Thor number six. So, yeah, so, so let's just say the top five yeah. are dramatically more profit or not maybe not profitable, dramatically higher revenue. Revenue. And once you get between five and six, right, almost you'll announce $500 it, million dollars less. Half a billion dollars. That's right. right? It, and you raised that point earlier, and that, I didn't even think of that, but you're right. It's a precipitous drop. And I think yeah. it just goes to show you the stakes that are involved with these movies, yeah. right? I mean, even in the top 10, you're talking about a difference between the number one movie and the number 10 movie. We're talking about a difference of $1.2 billion. It's not, that's crazy in a span of five months. That's insane. I mean, but this is, this is something that I've, I've also read about, which is, you know, we we've lost kind of the middle class of movies yeah you know like even when you like when you watch i remember watching stranger things a few weeks ago and they there was like this mall scene and they showed like what movies are playing there were like five good movies playing right at the same and time now the pro- yeah yes at the same time and and now the problem is that there's the big five and they've all kind of got their release two month period right and then it's everything else is kind of like a filler. Yeah. And and I think that's a problem not only for that we're going to have to deal with not only for the cinema chains, but also for moviegoers, which is I'm not going to 25 movies a year anymore. I know you are because <laughs> there's not that there's not that many good movies in the cinemas, right? Yeah. Thor Love and Thunder's got its two month period. Min- Minions has its two months. Strange has two months. Jurassic has two months. Top Gun has two months. We haven't seen anything in a while. Bullet Train, okay, but yeah. like you said, it's it's these top five that are eating everything. Yeah, it's kind of now like once they announce six. that this is the date yeah. this movie is coming out, everybody's like, okay, well, we have to avoid the weekend before, two weekends yeah. before, and three to four weekends after, and then let's put our movie in. It's because people are saying, I know I've put in a good movie. I've put together a good movie in Bullet Train, and I know that it's going to be a commercial success, but I don't want to be overshadowed by Jurassic World or Minions or whatever it is. You know, I'm giving you random examples. But the idea is, okay, so the top Mm -hmm. five movies, we we kind of nailed it in terms of our predictions, right? In the top five. Yeah. 
The order may be wrong or incorrect, but our top five was not too dissimilar from the real world top five uh, yeah. in terms of prediction. Yeah. And I, I think when the two of us are able you, to do you had, that. You had all five in your top five in a slightly different order. I had five in my top six. I had Jurassic World at six. Yeah. In in terms of revenue, that's wrong. In terms of quality, probably that's absolutely correct. right. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and so I think that, you know, when when Disney and and Paramount and Warner Brothers announced that these are the movies that we're putting out this summer and these are the release dates, every other studio says, "Well, okay, there's no way I can release Morbius on July weekend, uh, July first week, uh, July fourth weekend because I know Morbius isn't going to do well compared to Top Gun." Oh, dude, that's crazy. Morbius is not even in the top ten here. Oh no. First of all, it wasn't a summer movie. And second of all, even if it were a summer movie, I don't think it would have come close. I think it would have just been, uh, I don't remember what the top, the number was, but at least critically, it shouldn't be anywhere near this list. Wow, so not even top 10? Oh, maybe, but I don't know what the numbers were. Uh, honestly, it was, it was such a bad movie that I stopped following it altogether. It was released April 1st. Yeah. It had 17 million day one, 13 million day two. I mean, it, it it just plummeted after that. Yeah, yeah. It had an opening weekend, and that's it. Even shockingly, you want to know a crazy statistic? Morbius opening day seventeen million. Sonic the Hedgehog two opening day twenty six million. There you go. There you go. It probably made more money in that Whoa. one day than it did than Morbius did in that weekend. Whoa. So. Going back to our list just quickly, yeah. number six, Elvis with 282 million. Number seven, mm. Lightyear with 219 million. Number mm. eight, Bullet Train with 199 million. Hold on. Number can we just can we stop by Bullet Train? Yeah. Do you think that this is a superb disappointment for the Bullet Train team? I don't think so. I don't remember what the budget really? is. I don't know what the budget is, but I imagine that the budget was very low or relatively low. And I think in terms of the type of movie it is, which is to say an older, let's say more mature leading man doing an action sequence, it seems about right. It's kind of like the nobody. It's kind of like the John Wick. Uh, less how, how much does How much does John Wick generate? I will look it up right now. You go on with your top 10. Let me look this up and then we'll reconvene, yeah? Okay. And then number nine, DC League of Super Pets with 162 million. And number 10, Nope, also with 162 million, but I think just short a couple hundred thousand behind that. Now, I will caveat this list by saying that with some exceptions, like Top Gun, the strongest performers on this list were also released earlier in the summer. So they had a longer runway. So for example, of all of these movies, Bullet Train and Nope, for example, and DC League of Super Pets were released most recently, so they had a shorter runway. So you take that with a grain of salt, but then, you know, when you're talking about a difference of half a billion dollars, it's not the runway at that point. You know, it's not the length of time in the theater. All right, so here is here's worldwide box office for John Wick. The original 2014. 76. You know, eight years right? ago. Yeah. 76 million the chapter two had 171. Yeah. Parabellum had 327. Yeah. There you go. So it's not, you know, so when yeah, you say $200 million, yeah. $199 million, that's in the ballpark. Right. It probably and of course, earns a sequel. It and, probably and earns a sequel. Exactly. Right? It earns a sequel. And then, of yeah. course, that sequel will be just like what happened with yeah. John Wick and chapter two. Yeah. The, the transition between yeah. John Wick 1 and John Wick 2 is that it will also be slightly more over the top. It'll also be a little bit more stylish. It'll also be, it'll also have more A-list stars in it. And when that happens, that 199 million that uh, the first one earned will probably translate to 400 million in the second. Just based on the numbers, uh, as you've rightly, you've already reached that assumption. And yeah. I think correctly, yeah. which is to say that the executives behind it are probably thinking, Hey, we made $200 million on the first time with Brad Pitt in this kind of role. The sequel, whoever it is, even if it's not Brad Pitt, the numbers alone, if we get some A-list stars, whoever it's going to be, I think will be warranting a sequel. Yeah. 
I mean, I didn't see Bullet Train. You saw it, right? Uh, no, not yet. It's on my watch list. I have to say, I thought the trailer was quite bad. I, I, I think I think they should have recut the trailer. Brad Pitt is funny. And he oh, is he's charismatic. Great. He's great. I thought that that trailer was really... It seemed like a trailer for like an Adam Sandler movie. I just thought that the jokes were like the lowest common denominator. Mm-hmm. I, th- I think they could have tightened that up a little bit and had a much better trailer. And I would have been more enthusiastic for it. Right. Anyway, neither here nor there. That is our summer predictions. What do we have for autumn? You know, if you look at the list of upcoming movies, you've got a few like rom-com style, like Ticket to Paradise. You've got a Boy, f- do you want to see that? A few action sequence, um, action movies. You've got uh, Black Adam. You've got Black yep. Panther. Also, Avatar is coming out. Then you've got yes. a few quirkier movies. You've got things like Amsterdam. You've got See How They Run. You've got the sequel to Knives Out. That's coming yes. out, although that's a direct-to-Netflix movie, maybe not necessarily a cinema movie, but still. So there's quite a few quirky movies. Yeah. I mean, I, I think those are those are actually very, very... I think Black Adam and Avatar are highly... And Scream is coming out again, right? I think those two are like really going to be big movies. I mean, I don't know how well Black Adam will do. Every time they release a trailer for it, I get disappointed. I think it's going to be not yeah. good. I'm the Rock not, is so likable, though. He, He's he, so likable. But that's my point, is he, for such a likable guy, they've given him, or he has chosen such an unlikable D-bag of, uh, you know, Black Adam was a villain originally. He becomes kind of like a pseudo good guy, but he's not really. And when you are The Rock and you can choose any superhero you want in any platform you want, it's a shock to me that he would go out of his way to choose a bad guy. The Rock is also not a super young guy anymore, right? I mean, no, he's exactly. totally jacked for a guy his age, but he's not really that young anymore. Does he have a lot of options, objectively, for someone to say, hey, we want to build a, a franchise around you? Does he have a 10-year run? I mean, he's J.K. Simmons in, in 10 years, right? Maybe 20 years. I, look, does yeah. he have a 10-year run? Can he put yeah. together three to four more movies as the same role in a franchise? Absolutely. I definitely yeah. think he can. Would he have had a better run in terms of physical presence yeah. 10 years ago? I also yeah. agree to that. But yeah. my feeling is that he has a lot of star it's power of and negotiating power. And yeah. uh, Warner Brothers doesn't. Like, they don't have that yeah. leverage. David Zaslav, yeah. for all his strength, does not have that leverage with the DC Universe. I what, think What if, character is there for him, though? I mean, maybe that's the problem, is that a lot of the characters have been... You know who he could have been? And yeah. this is going to be controversial... He could have been Green Lantern. He could have been one of the original seven founders of the Justice League. They have a black Green Lantern. I don't know why they didn't go with him. And then you kind of sweep away the Ryan Reynolds thing. And frankly speaking, Green Lantern is a way more compelling character and a way more important character than freaking Black Adam. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's a very good point. I mean, because I agree, like... Five years ago, yeah, I mean, if he would have taken a character, you know, he'd have really be established by now and he could be writing that out. Yeah, Dude, I, I mean, I love The Rock, but yeah, I mean, even is, I have to say, yeah. we're getting very close to Brad Pitt, the John Wick. What's the other guy who plays Bob Odenkirk and nobody? Yeah. And what's the other guy? Uh, his daughter's always being uh, Liam Neeson. Taken. Yeah, right? Yeah. Like it's he's not at that age, clearly not. And even yeah. if he were, he's such he's in such good physical shape. He works out yeah. so much that he can extend that life. But uh-huh. my question to him is when you have the ability to really grab DC by the cojones and you say this is what I want to yeah. do, why aren't you doing that? Yeah. And for someone who's kind of known for being a super charismatic guy, yeah. I truly believe he could have gone in and sat with Walter Hamada at DC yeah. and even with David Zaslav at Warner Discovery now and said, 
this is what I want to do. And you're going to let me do it. And you're going to pay me for it. And you're going to be thankful that I'm doing it. Because frankly speaking, there's no one else I can think of right now that isn't already associated with someone else or with another character or with another universe that could have that strength to do that. I think the only other person I can see who can do that right now is Keanu Reeves. But Keanu Reeves isn't going to play a Black Adam style character or like an action action superhero. That's not what Keanu Reeves is going to do at this age at this stage in his life. He's going to be more of a cerebral character. I'm looking at the filmography of Dwayne Johnson, right? The Rock. Mm -hmm. Uh... Not the best. As much as I love the guy, he's carved out a little bit of a niche with Kevin Hart in these buddy cop style movies at the moment. The last, like, I think the last three or four comedies he's done has been with uh, Kevin Hart, at least over the last 10 years. And that's fine. But even after that, even after some time, that kind of wears thin, right? How many times do you want to see them getting in shenanigans yeah. together? I mean, Red Notice, which we, which we went over dramatically, right? Jumanji, there were two Jumanjis. We love Jumanji. Ballers, but that's a TV. Yep. Fast, Fast and Furious, but that's not since 2019. Skyscraper was terrible. Rampage was terrible. Uh, Baywatch was pretty terrible. Essential yeah, Intelligence, yep, that was with uh, Kevin Hart. Yep. San Andreas, yeah, we've seen that. So yeah, it was really the Fast and Furious is and GI Joe. I wish they would have brought back GI Joe. It was really, it was really only yeah in terms of Fast franchise and movies, Furious. absolutely. And French and even Fast and the Furious yeah. that imploded with the Vin Diesel drama. So yeah. you know, it's not. Uh, it's in, if you look at it in terms of franchise and with someone like The Rock, with an actor like The Rock, that's how you have to think of it, right? You can't look at his yeah. career and say, well, he went from strength to strength or from movie to movie. It's not. Yeah. It's because with actors of that kind who kind of rely purely on charisma and who kind of rely purely on physicality, you go from franchise to franchise. You, that's how yeah. you determine success. He's not like, like a Tom Cruise when you're looking at – 12 different roles over 12 different years and each one of them is stellar because the acting is stellar with the greatest of respect to the rock there's a reason why he hasn't been nominated jungle cruise in 2021 yeah that's that's exactly what he should not be doing he should have taken oh i'm really upset about 2021 okay i understand you did jumanji in 2019 i do love jumanji but that should have been the end of it for such a likable guy, yeah, his filmography is long, but not amazing. Not amazing. Okay. Yeah. So that's our summer box office breakdown. I would say that both of us did a reasonably good job. Yeah. I, I think, so. think that in terms of order, really, we got a little, not messed up, but we got a little thrown around by the fact that Maverick... Top Gun Maverick was much, much more successfully uh, than we anticipated on a global scale. Yeah. Jurassic World fell in line with what I expected, which was it was going to be a terrible movie, but because they brought in all the stars back, it carried through Uh, with nostalgia. I have no desire. If they announce another Jurassic Park, and I know that they will, I have... Zero desire to see it. I think what they'll do is like a ju- Jurassic Universe, all new characters, 10 years from now, when everything's kind of died down. I still think we could write something better where we talked about, I think our idea was, we said it was the reverse, right? Yeah, that where the, like they bring the dinosaurs back some, di- were, some flu or some kind yeah. of pandemic yeah. because yeah. that's some Although ancient that hits, Yeah, but that really hits hard for, I mean, that really hits home now, right? Pandemic movies are really... No, not I agree. Involved. Maybe not the maybe not the most appropriate, but you know what I mean. Yeah. Like some kind of sickness that can yeah. that has to that results yeah. by the fact that and then we learned that maybe it wasn't the meteors that knocked Correct. the dinosaurs out. It was actually yes. this. You know what I mean? Correct. That's what I mean. So yeah, it, they need to change the narrative. Right now, it's it's just so like bilateral, right? It's dinosaurs versus humans. Every every installment is is some type of narrative. Some about that, form right? of they need to, how do we cage the dinosaurs? Correct. How do we trap yeah. them? Versus how do we work with them? You know, exactly. So, okay. All right, so Pete. That is real. our results. We did well. Thank you, everyone. If you've got any notes you want to send us or any messages you want to send us about 
what you think about this summer's box office, let us know. Aloha at filmsandstuffpodcast.com or tweet at us at FNS Podcast. We've got updated website, updated logos, updated everything. Please check it out. And give us your feedback. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Have a great weekend ahead. Thank you, Pete. Thanks, Ethan. Bye. Thank you for listening to another episode of Films and Stuff. If you haven't already, please subscribe and review on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever podcasts are downloaded. Films and Stuff. There is no substitute.